Dr. Rob, can you believe it's the last webinar of the year? We're wrapping up 2023. For those of you listening, and it's June, for some of you listening online, (laughs) just know that we got through the holidays. But I do want to say something to all of you, which is um, despite the pain of whatever you're going through, um, this is a season to have some gratitude for the things in your life. And if you're not understandably feeling grateful about your relationship, I try to look around and say, well, I have a home. I have people who love me. I have food on the table. Um, you know, I haven't had any, I haven't lost anyone recently. Um, I could, and I don't, Tammy does this at Thanksgiving, but I do on New Year's make an incredible list of, as long a list as I can of the things I'm gra- grateful for. And I do want to say one last thing about that, which is a, a, a very close person to me passed away not long ago. And I was thinking about, you know, we always get sad and, you know, we always have feel lost. And I realized that I regretted something. And the thing I regretted most of all was not having been more grateful, not having said to this person I love, thank you for this and thank you for that. And I realized that part of my challenges in life are not being grateful enough to the people who make a difference in my life. So I want to say to all of you, regardless of the challenges you're in, there is light there and it's all around you. And it may not be in the situation you're facing, but but take a look around and realize how incredibly fortunate you are. Even if you can be here, you have a computer, you have a mind, you know, you're here. And uh, and so many are not. So anyway, I wanted to share that. I see Tammy nodding her head. Is there anything you wanted to say, Tammy, well, before I, we get started? I, I, um, I lost somebody very significant in my world. And, and I have a, a photo frame right here. And photos come up you know, including of that person and I smile. And so like, I have gratitude that that person was in my life and, Mm -hmm. and I don't have regrets because, you know, he knew it. Like I I made a point of telling him how incredibly grateful it was my father. I was, I was fortunate to have a father who was, uh, you know, he was a human, but he sure was a good to me dad. So, so like, like I, it's a good reminder though, to me, that like you're saying, I want to make sure that the people in my life know that I care and, um, you know, that I'm not just thinking it, but I'm, you know, I'm sharing that. So, um, stuff is lovely. You know, I had my goofy hat on stuff is fun, but you know what, like we don't take it with us. It really is about the relationships we have in our lives. And one of the things that I share, I shared this a number of times today with people is I am so incredibly grateful with seeking integrity. We strive for integrity for ourselves. We want to share that with other people. And that is a value that is, you know, that, that is esteemable to me. And so, uh, you know, so Dr. Rob, I'm incredibly grateful to you for creating for all of your decades of work and um, the program that you, you know, you were the, I can't think of the right word. The instigator is a good word. That wasn't the word I had. I was thinking incubator. That's not the right word, but like I was, I was not coming out with the right word, but yes, thank you. The impetus, the impetus for all of that. That was the word I was looking for. So, so I'm grateful. So, so I have to go back to you, Tammy, since we're being grateful. I don't know if you know this, but Tammy and I've known each other 15 years or something like that. And we work for different organizations in different places. We still work in different places, but but we've always sort of circled around each other. And at the end of some event, we'd sit and talk for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Tammy, beyond working with you, it's really been an honor to be your friend and to know you for so long. And I think we've helped each other out to find better better situations in various areas of our life. And I appreciate your guidance. Yeah, thank you. But I consistently affirm that I'm incredibly grateful that this team values integrity. You know, not every organization does. And so, so to have that as, you know, something that is really key to me that we, we work, you know, we're human as always, we don't do it a hundred percent, but we sure, sure try. So, okay. We're going to get on to your questions. So type them in the Q and a husband was told he did not have a sex addiction, but did get diagnosed with OCPD and ADHD in 2021, when growing up, his parents were abusive towards each other and him. Can you speak about the difference between obsessive compulsion versus addiction to porn? I've been working on my betrayal trauma for two years. The damage is the same. Mm. Well, um, let me first say that um, the majority of professionals that I have worked with, especially psychiatrists, don't understand the issues we treat. And they will often say, oh, that's not it. It must be this or that's not it. They must be bipolar and they're manic or they must be have OCD. And, you know, just listening to this, I already don't agree with what's been said um, because um, 
uh, and and there are, and I don't know if he's OCD or not, and I will answer your question. Um, but those are separate issues from our problem. There are many people with OCD. Well, let me just explain the difference. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder is what she's talking about, and OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, people who ha are obsessive compulsive they um and as opposed to addiction they tend to do things over and over again in active repetitive ways in order to alleviate anxiety just like addiction the difference is that most of the things that people with ocd focus their uh their attention on to relieve anxiety are not pleasurable so the person who uh washes their hands you know to over and over again the person who checks the stove because they're worried that it might be on over and over again the person who can only take one exit on the freeway because they're afraid something bad might happen if they took another exit i've had clients who knew many how many tiles there were on the ceiling you know stuff like that there is a great need to relieve my anxiety and feel better on a whole bunch of levels by obsessing about something out there. And it is a brain problem. Addiction is is similar, but the difference is, is that addicts do over, things over and over again to relieve anxiety, but those are pleasurable things. You know, counting tiles on the ceiling or washing your hands 25 times a day, it may alleviate anxiety, but it's not fun. It doesn't make you feel good. It may for the moment relieve some of the anxiety, but then you're back at it. And that's like addiction, but in addiction, I'm, I'm, persistently seeking drugs. I'm seeking the experience of gambling. I'm seeking the intensity of sex in order to make myself feel better. It may be compulsive. And that's why we talk about sexual compulsivity, but that doesn't mean that it is obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so doing something and over and over again is compulsive, but the reason you do it divides, well, not the reason, I'm sorry, the reason is the same, alleviate anxiety, but how you do it um, it tells me the difference between addiction and OCD. So one of the things comes up to me is, uh, when was, who evaluated him? Does this person have a background in addiction? Do they understand sex addiction? And I say this because Tammy and I, having done this for so long, we have a lot of resources and we know a lot of people, a lot of good psychiatrists, a lot of, it may be worth having this person reevaluated in the light of someone who understands addiction. Um, as far as you're concerned, it's the same thing. Right. Um, well, I wouldn't say it's the same thing. I mean, if you know that it's truly mental illness, not that I don't consider addiction to be a mental illness, but I mean a profound brain problem, um, then I can understand them doing things over and over again that are problematic for you. But this, you know, I, I know compulsive masturbators, but they're addicted to that because it feels good to them. That's very different than someone who's compulsive about how many, you know what the, um, by the way, the, the easiest way I used to think about this is, Tammy, I don't know if you did this, but when you have to skip the cracks on the sidewalk, because you're afraid if you, what is it? Step on the crack, step break, on your the crack break your mother's back. Right. Yes. Well, we did that purposely because it was playful, but someone has OCD actually is worried that if they step on the right bad place, that bad things will happen. Um, that's not what addicts are. They're focused on the intensity, the excitement, the distraction. They're looking for the fun, even though both are compulsive. Um, so it is unlikely to me that someone is betraying you with their sexual behavior because of OCD. To me, that's unlikely. Um, could certainly be true, but I think more information is needed. And I wonder what professionals have you seen other than the psychiatrist? How much have you uh, trained, you know, learned about um, about addiction, about sex addiction? Who do you have to support you? What kind of groups do you go to? You know, there are a lot of questions about it. You can get more information simply from some doctor who says this or that. I know if you're here, you've got information, but I wonder if there's more you could get. Um, so tell me, I, I did a whole thing on that. Can you you did, and it was thoughts? great. Yeah, I was thinking because, you know, when, and I always say, and I don't know the exact stats, but I think it's about 15% of the clients who come to our residential treatment program do have a consultation with the professional that understands addiction and these issues. And it's really key because you're right. So many professionals don't have the understanding. And so they're quick to diagnose these other things. But I'm like, you know, I was thinking the same thing. Oh, porn is part of this. And, uh, you know, growing up, his parents were abusive towards him. You know what? Everybody who comes to our treatment program has some form of underlying issues, you know, like this is a maladaptive coping mechanism. Neglect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grief, mm -hmm. loss, you know, abandonment, you know, abuse, yeah, all some stew of all of those, you know, and, and with addiction work, you know, addiction recovery work, they can shift and move in a different direction. Um, so I, I'm with Dr. Rob too. I'm curious 
what is he doing? Because if it's just like, oh, well, I have OCD and ADHD and I'm, you know, it's part of the equation, but it's not an excuse. So how does, you know, how is he stopping the problematic behaviors that is so hurtful to you? What is he doing on a daily basis to, you know, be moving in a different direction? So, and yes, email Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. If you're interested in some resources, I'm glad you're here. We've got lots of resources for you. We talk about healthy boundaries for betrayed partners. It's, I mean, there's so much resources. It's, it's kind of overwhelming, but we'll try to give it to you, you know, in snippets so you can you know, take it in. Okay. I wanted to add one thing because I did. Please. Um, um, so um, OCD is treatable. And very yeah. readily treatable. And if not, so obsessive compulsive disorder is treated by um, by SSRIs. It's a whole category of uh, antidepressants like Prozac, like Lexapro, like some of the originals. And at high doses, uh, not the ones that are used for depression, but they are absolutely helpful in OCD. And in fact, I had a niece, Tammy, you know, went to treatment and she said, I don't know how other, I just keep obsessing. And she got on the right medication. She said, literally, I didn't know, is this how normal people feel? So I would be surprised if someone with OCD wasn't on specific meds, certain dosages of meds, you know, you can significantly reduce OCD um, to the point where you might be anxious or fearful, but you don't have to go do that, that thing. And by the way, there are treatments and therapies for OCD. So if this person is not on medication, if they're not um, in a program to deal with it, um, I would be concerned in any case, because there is help um, for OCD and, and very good levels of help. So in any case, Tammy. I, no, there, there's a tag on to this. It was a CSAT. She said he was compulsive. Now compulsive, all addicts are compulsive. You know, we have impulse control issues, but if she said he was OCD, most CSATs are not qualified to do the, no. please talk about that. Well, no, I'm sorry, Tammy, I interrupted you, but you know, this is like going to your G, you know, you have a General you have a swelling on your TV. arm yeah. and your general practitioner says, oh, you know, it looks like it might be this or that. You've got a bruise. Well, what if it doesn't go, if it doesn't go away and it doesn't get better, like they said, then you'd have to go to a specialist. If this, some, if someone has a, a clear mental health concern like OCD, um, they need to see a psychiatrist. And I, you know, I'm pretty good at it. In fact, I would say I'm very, very good at evaluation. That's why I do these consultations that Tammy books for me to our consults. But I, one of my best skills is evaluation. I would have made a good psychiatrist. But when I suspect that someone at Seeking Integrity has depression, has Asperger's, has ADHD, no matter how well my skill set is saying, I wonder if that's going on with that person. And because they might, let's make sure that they see our consulting psychiatrist so that we can be sure. And then we tell the doctor the symptoms and then, and you know, I would say eight out of 10, they do. So my ears are pretty good and my eyes are pretty good. And maybe that person's is too, but they're not the person to give that diagnosis. Depression, sure. Sure. Anxiety, sure. Things that are not as um, severe, but OCD is severe. And I would not expect any CSAT unless they were a MD to be able to diagnose that. So that concerns me. Um, and by the way, were you there during the evaluation? Um, I don't know if you were or not, but I don't know if, if you know this, but addicts tend to lie. They tend to minimize. They tend to blame shift like, it, oh, it's really this. It's not that. So it may well be that this person wasn't simply, you know, found a way to talk about it like OCD rather than honestly being honest about what he or she is doing. So this all sounds like a little out of balance and not quite right to me. And um, I think more evaluation is needed by a, 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 a licensed medical professional psychiatrist. Yes, but if she, if the CSAT said compulsive, yes, you know, yes, that is- I'm compulsive, compulsive. Tammy's compulsive, yeah, addiction. Yeah. Uh, yes, addiction, whatever form it takes, there's compulsivity. That doesn't mean we have OCD. So it absolutely would re require, in my opinion, to getting, I mean, you want to know what you've got. Like, so getting the proper diagnosis, then you know how to treat it. So, And by the way, we're all a little OCD. Well, I don't, won't speak for Tammy, but when bad things are going on in my house, I clean. I love, there's nothing I like we better than doing both the do laundry. That. Okay, yeah. we show this. The toilets are always um, really clean. Yeah. I get really yeah. compulsive around making yeah. sure the dishes and are, you know, are the shelves and is the laundry and it alleviates my anxiety. Um, a lot better than what I used to do, 
but it's not consistent. I am not consistently feeling like I have to make sure. It's just, a, oh, I kind of want to have control. And so I can put things in order and I feel better about myself. And it can be compulsive, mm -hmm. but that isn't anything like OCD or, or addiction. Um, so, and our houses are very clean, aren't they, Tim? What? At certain times, uh, right? If, at certain if they're times. really clean, guess what? Our stress level is a little higher. So, okay, so the next one is just a gratitude. Thank you. So glad to have you both as a resource for the past two years. I'm grateful to both of you, and we're grateful you're here. You know. You. So, how often is it in early recovery that relapse and lies to their partner for two months and claims that they do not know they were relapsing? So I'm going to start with this. You can't you? relapse yeah. if you are not in recovery. So, and recovery really takes time. So the, the stopping of the problematic behaviors, that's abstinence. That's all it is. I'm just not doing the problematic behaviors. That's abstinence. But if you're still lying and, and doing all of this stuff, there's no recovery there. So, so in early recovery, um, this, I'm going to tag this back to the first question. What's, what's this person doing to be, on a recovery path, you know, how many 12 steps meetings a week, you know, what step is he working? You know, what, how often is he talking to a sponsor? How often is he seeing a CSAT therapist? Is he on this now? Is he doing the dropping groups on seeking integrity? Is he doing a work group on seeking integrity? That would all be, if he's just stopping the behavior intermittently, that's abstinence. And it's really more the cycle of addiction. You know, maybe he can go, you know, 60 days, maybe he can go 90 days. And then he, then he acts out again. That's just the cycle of addiction. So, so to me, this is, I'm going to flip it. I do this a lot. What are you doing for you? What healthy boundaries are you doing for your safety, your physical safety, emotional safety, financial safety, and spiritual safety? Those boundaries are for your safety, not punishment against someone else. So, so I, I would invite, you've got no control over him, but you sure do have the ability to work on creating the necessary boundaries for you to create safety. So, okay. What about you? Well, I think you've really got it, Tammy. I don't think there's a lot more I can say. Um, really what I heard her say is um, you can't relapse if you've never, if you're just starting. Um, people who have six months or a year of stopping the behavior, they may have a slip. And let me explain what a slip is. A slip is a return to problematic behavior. You know, I wasn't taking care of myself. I was stressed out. I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't doing good self-care. I stopped going to meetings, whatever it is. And I went out and I did my acting out again or porn or whatever. A slip means I immediately go back and I tell the people I'm working with and I tell my therapist and then I tell my spouse and that's that. A relapse is I start doing the behavior again and I don't tell anyone and I don't do anything about it and I keep it hidden. And of course that keeps the cycle, puts the cycle back in motion because now I'm getting away with it again. But regardless of that, um, I, I don't, again, Tammy said it isn't here. Are this, how often is this person going to 12 step meetings? How much support do they have? Are they going to our drop-in groups? Are they, you know, if they don't even understand and have a, a, a tight fix on what recovery is, um, then they're going to do this. And by the way, I wouldn't be surprised um, if it's a way of saying to you, I'm really trying to work on it. And, and you see, it's a very hard journey and I keep falling into it again. And, you know, there's a, there's a little worry I have about dishonesty mm. here. I'm not sure if it's actually what the deal is, but um, something doesn't feel quite right to me about this. So let's, uh, let's keep so healthy boundaries for you. Okay. My husband says he can't do the things I've asked for check-ins and connection activity because he needs me to give him safety first and every time we do these things they go sideways so he doesn't enjoy them and fearful that they will go wrong it's been two and a half years since discovery 20 months from formal therapeutic disclosure 25 months from restitution i need him to do these things first for me to feel safe how do we get past this impasse i'm losing steam and depleted and waiting i don't blame you i'm sorry I was going to jump in, Tim, if you don't mind, um, because this came up today. Um, oh, I was wow. running a group with the, so the people in our treatment program here in California, <clears throat> they're here for three, four weeks, and I work with them regularly. I'm involved with them, and I was doing a group today with them, and one of them asked the question, how do I handle it when my wife is being abusive? And I, he, I said, what do you mean abusive? And he said, well, she tells me that I'm, I don't, I should, I'm not worthy of living and that, um, no, I'm unlovable completely. And no one should ever be with me and things that I do think are abusive. And we talked, you know, it's one thing to say, I'm angry at you. I'm hurt. You ruined my life. 
Um, you're not the person I thought you would be. It's another thing to go after someone's character and say, you know, you basically you're a bad person. Um, so what we talked about was what he could do in the moments when he felt that was going on to set a boundary and say, you know what, if I'm hearing these things like you're an asshole, you're whatever the the really what he felt was abusive thing that he could step away for a while and then come back. And so what I'm saying to you is he may be there may be things that you're saying or doing that are overwhelming to him. He may feel like he needs more safety. That may be true. And, I, and I'm not saying that it, that it is. I'm just giving both sides. And so I do think it's important for you to work on both of you. What is acceptable when we communicate? What isn't acceptable to communicate? Can I take a time out? Um, you know, let me write down the things that I am unable to tolerate or have a really hard time with. Um, so I'm sorry, are you looking at me like I'm not getting this? And I'm going with the first no, part, which is he I'm, doesn't no, feel no, no, safe. No, 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 I'm, I'm thinking, that's all. You're getting my so huh, look. So. What I said to the client was, I think, number one, I don't think you should worry about what's going on out there. I think you should worry about the fact that you were here. The other thing I said to him is, uh, I said a bunch of things. One of the things I said is, I really want you to know that the person who you're married to and who's loved you, they don't want to be this person. They don't want this person who's saying bad things to you and cursing, whatever it is. How do they end up being this person? And what is your part in having that happen? So I turned it back on him to look at how, what kind of abuse, neglect, uh, violations, distancing, uh, lying, cheating. How did he end up with this spouse who's felt so violated and so angry? Um, on the other hand, I do think that if your fights are not productive, this is what this is what couples therapy is about. This is where you sit with another professional and you figure out. Literally, I I will say to the guys, make a list of what is okay that you say and what isn't okay. Actually, what um, what did I ask him? Oh, um, anyway, it doesn't matter what I said to him. But my point is, is that I, I you know I don't just want to go with um, well, let me say one more thing. It shouldn't be enjoyable. These are I was thinking conversations the same thing. which are like, yeah. oh, gee, you know, we're talking about how you ruined my life and we're talking about how you're not doing anything to help yourself. And you're probably it's not fun. It, it, it isn't supposed to be fun, at least at the beginning. It's supposed to have be two one that you're clearly communicating and taking time out for that. In my mind, part of it is that you don't end up all day long saying, did you do this? Well, I didn't do that. You know, you need, you have it cont contained to a particular space, but it's not fun. Maybe over the years, once you start having a habit of communicating, you might start to get into more loving and meaningful conversations. But in the beginning, it's rough and it should be rough. Um, so Tammy, you want to answer the second part, which I didn't about the time well, from recovery and yeah, it, I want to go back to the, because every time we do these things, they will go wrong. I'm like, I want to know what are his suggestions for how, like, I'm afraid this is going to go wrong. Can we try something else? I didn't hear anything in this about like, what are his suggestions? This just, fe to me, this feels, um, avoidant and a little manipulative of like, oh, I'm going to you need to make me feel safe. And I'm like, well, you're the person that betrayed. So it's honestly, the onus is on you to create and start creating the safety. You guys are stuck. So I agree with Dr. Rob getting the, you know, getting a couple's therapist in, you know, and I would also look at, you know, these activity, first of all, I'll check in the Thanos check on, you guys can do that in two and a half minutes each. So in five minutes, you know, so this is not a long drawn out thing, but I would, I'm curious about the activities because you're saying these activities and I'm curious what they are and if you've articulated this is important to me because and if he goes I'm afraid to do that because that that's also a conversation but you know like then then where's the middle ground because you guys are here and you guys can hold those lines forever you know but I hear you're worn out you are depleted so um so a couple's therapist but also having the conversation of we're stuck I'm tired of doing this I call it the negative two-step so so what are you, you know, what are your suggestions for, for creating safety within the relationship? I'm willing to listen to this. I would also like to share with you why these things are important to me and what I think they, that they could do. I'm open to some feedback on how, you know, on tweaking them a little bit, you know, if, if there's room, but, but if like, it feels to me, especially after all of this time, like, oh, I did my formal therapy disclosure. I'm, I'm afraid you know, rather than going, wow, that part do is done and we've made it through this far, um, well, I, that fear is getting caught in this. Go ahead, please. Well, I do, you know, I, I, I want you partners to understand, and I think I've written books for you, that I am supportive of you. And I do as much as I can as a male sex addict understand what you're going through. I've written about it. I've taught about it. You know, I think I have a clue of what you're going through. 
And I want to say with all respect and, and, and dignity that sometimes spouses say things they didn't mean to say. Sometimes you are so overwhelmed that you end up in a situation you didn't mean to. Um, sometimes, but I don't read um, any of that in this. Like I, I'm not. Oh, I don't know. But, okay. but what I want to know is specifically what does going sideways mean? What mm. does fear? What is what if what is it's going wrong mean mm -hmm. to him? It may mean a completely different thing than it means to you. And and I often will. And I think that you know. Um, not with addiction, but in the healing part, um, everybody's got to look at their part in the healing part. And you guys are not newcomers. So if there is, and I'm going to be all due respect, yelling and screaming and blaming and naming at 20 months in, then something may right because you guys should be having better communication more. And so you said, I'm losing steam and depleted and waiting. I think you wait, if you want this to get better, you got another five years to wait. You're going to have to figure out how to do something about it. And I have a feeling that it's going to involve another person, but there's a lot, you know, I want you to write down to him to tell me the 10 things that you're fearful about. Tell me what, uh, write a paragraph on what sideways means. Make sure it's so clear that you know what he's talking about. Rather, it feels very vague. And yes. addicts love vague. Um, yes. Go ahead, Tammy. That, that's what I was thinking too. It's like, you know, it's just, oh, it's going to go sideways. So we're going to just avoid that uncomfortable, unpleasant, which is what addicts do in, you know, in active addiction. We're always looking to avoid, you know, everything. So, uh, but yes, being curious, just say, I'm curious, you know, I, I, I love being curious because what I make up in my mind is, is sometimes the case, but not always. So I'm curious, what, what does being sideways mean to you? You know, what are you thinking is going to be enjoyable when we start doing this initially? And, you know, do you see a path for, you know, uh, for us being together in a different way in, in the future, if we're willing to take these steps, you know, some of those things. So by the way, I want to add to that. What does safety first mean? What, what does he need for safety? What does he mean he needs to feel safety first? What does that mean exactly? Can he give you 10 examples? I really, one of the things I love about doing treatment, especially with addicts, is that you can take a piece of paper. What are the pros and cons? What are the rights and wrongs? You know, this isn't just how did it go in your family? So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for you to learn from each other. You know, mistakes and problems are opportunities to learn. And I think there's a lot the two of you could grow and learn about with each other. But like you said, not right now, because you're stuck. Okay, let's keep going, Tim. Okay. I am newly discovered betrayed partner. My partner of five years opened up about their lifetime sexual addiction. I am unsure if I would like to rebuild or just pick up the pieces and move on. However, can you tell me the best way to support my partner to seek help or respectfully encouraging him to tell his family for healing? Um, well, I just want to answer the last thing and because I kind of react to that and I'd love you to jump in, Tammy, because you get these calls so often. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but people call Tammy all day long. I don't know how she and email and text and and she can handle I don't answer the I, phone at a bunch like two o'clock in the morning it's going to voicemail I'm telling you that. So <laughs> but I will say to you, and let me say nice things about you that Tammy okay. is one of the most dedicated people to helping people I know and she will put down everything she's doing if she can to try to help you. And the reason I said that is because um why did I say that? Oh, um, I don't know why I said that, but I'm glad I said it. <laughs> um, it will come to me in a minute. Um, so, uh, so, oh, I wanted you to go next. But anyway, um, the part I react to a little bit is telling his family for healing. Um, I don't need to tell my family to heal. I just need to talk to you about it. And sometimes it feels like you need to tell your parents or you need to tell your kids or, you know, and it's sometimes us saying, you've heard me so much. Now you're going to go ha have to go out and tell everybody, you know, how bad you are, if you will. And I don't know if that's what's going on or not, but I don't think that I would work on respectfully asking him to tell it, tell his family. He doesn't need to tell his family for healing. Um, the, the piece about supporting him though, and rebuilding, Tammy, I, I really want you to talk about this because I, I'm a newly discovered partner, um, a betrayed partner. I think there's a lot you could say about being in that position, um, newly discovered and looking for how you can help him. Um, do you yes. have thoughts about that? Well, I do. And I actually, for this question and the next one, um, there, there are dropping groups. This is a webinar format. A dropping group is different. A dropping group is not recorded. So you can't go watch those later, but it's a safe space. They're all hosted by a person and there's separate ones for betrayed partners from those that are struggling with the compulsive behaviors and they're all listed. So I, I included that. And they're link. free. And they're free. 
And then separately, we have online work groups. Those are psychoeducation. That is not therapy or treatment, but many therapists suggest that people participate in those because it helps um, advance their work with the individual therapist. In, it's in an a educational much, process. Yeah. Well, but, but, you know, but, but I'll tell you what, somebody hears something and go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Or, you know, you read a book and, and we read it with a lens and we can manipulate the words on the page or skip that paragraph. And so you start hearing from someone else. Oh, I hadn't thought about that being, you know, a betrayal. Okay. Well, that's, that's more information. And guess what? Somebody just said it. So them too. So, so it reduces shame, you know, it really does help. So those work groups, those are low cost. Um, those are six week courses, 90 minutes a week live facilitated, but there's sex addiction 101, porn addiction 101 for those that are not acting out with, with people. It's all online. That's a better fit, but there's a betrayed partner group. And here's the deal, whether you stay or go, please do the healing work you need to do. There's grieving the loss of the relationship. You know, the, either way, there's a grieving the loss of the relationship you thought you had. We actually have a drop-in group for moving on alone on Thursdays for betrayed partners. It is specifically for uh, women who are leaving, have left, or were left. And so it's a specific one. I'm working on having one for guys check in next year. I'm working on it. Um, harder to find a person to host that one, but I'm working on it. But but I, for him, the, the you know, if he really, really wants help, you know what? That's what we do at our residential treatment program. It's only for men, but we have a family specialist that helps support, you know, partners and spouses as well. But like, that's the highest level of help. Here's a, here's a little trick on the homepage of Seeking Integrity. There's an online assessment. He can get a score of where he is. And if he's, you know, a certain number, then this will be, you know, very effective. If he's a, a different number, then, you know, then residential pr treatment not only is, is helpful, it's really recommended. I, the acting out is absolutely the top layer. It's a maladaptive coping mechanism. So getting help to not just stop the problematic behaviors, abstinence, but address the underlying issues is how we can move forward. And for those that are willing to be on this journey, and it's a lifelong journey, but you guys could have a better relationship. If you choose, you get to choose, but you could have a better relationship, more honest, if he does the work, you know, and you're willing to wait and, and see if he's willing to do the work. I, I wanted to jump in really quickly and support what Tammy said, but I want to back it up by what you said, which is I'm unsure whether mm -hmm. I should rebuild or pick up the pieces or how to support him. Or, or To me, that's someone who doesn't have enough information, you know, newly discovered. How much do you know? And I'm not trying to be accusatory. I'm saying you're asking very meaningful questions. And this is one of the things I, I said to the guys today was, you know, you want to make you make decisions out of an emotional place. And you don't consider what any thoughtfulness about it. And I want I want you to feel good about not making any decisions out of anger or hurt. Anger and hurt drive some of it. And you need to work on those things. And Tammy said, grieve. But I think there's a lot more information you need. That's why she mentioned the free groups, because you can sit in there with other men or women, depending on your gender and what's needed. And you can say, you know, you could you don't even have to, you can block your screen, you can not put up your name, but just listening. What is this person going through? What is that person going through? How are they handling this? You know, I, I agree the betrayed partners uh, groups are free. The work groups are paid. Get those words right. But nonetheless, you can't learn enough. And the best way for you to learn, to be honest, is in the presence of other people. Um, I know folks who say all the time, well, I, and Tammy gets this. Well, I heard every podcast. You know, I, I watched all your YouTube. I, I read the blogs. We appreciate that. I put that stuff out there so that people can have information for free that they may not have access to if they can't afford therapy or whatever. But it's not enough. You And there are other free resources and the ones that involve other people. In other words, that podcast, that blog, I hope it drives you to connect, to connect with other people who are in similar circumstances. I know it's humiliating. I, I know it's embarrassing. And there are people in those groups who have moved past that into understanding and insight about how to move forward. And also looking at him, what actions is he taking that would make me feel like staying or not? It's not just about how you feel. Are you seeing what will help you feel safe in the way he is conducting this part of it now? So lots more questions and answers for you. I, I really encourage you to start, do some of the drop-in groups, hang out with some of the other women or men who are even in here and learn more. Yes, there's another 
the, the old lady posties tomorrow morning that's for women of a certain age it sounds like you're not you know of a certain age I'd and so not. but wednesday at 12 30 pacific time um that one is a betrayed partner group and there's another one thursday morning and then again the moving on alone but yeah you know dr rob often talks about ambivalent love i love my hate him i love my hate him and you probably are feeling that right now and that's okay but like dr making? rob said it really is about his actions what is he willing to do you know let i you know i answered an email earlier today of like oh yeah he says he'll never do it again huge red flag you know huge red flag so so this is really what is what are his actions showing that's you know, that would be something to pay attention to, but do get support, lean into those. And keep his family out of it. Because, and let me just say one more thing about that. I understand that you think it might be helpful or it makes you feel better or, but once you tell that family member, Thanksgiving will never be the same. Uh, the holidays, maybe some of them will think, oh, he's got sexual issues. He can never come visit the grandkids or so uh, be very careful. And who, when you tell stuff like this, no matter how it makes you feel, you can't unsay it. So I would, again, I would check with a professional. I talked to other people who've been through this before you encourage him to do anything except start working on it himself. Okay. Okay. So the next question is, I saw you have a support group right. for women of betrayed partners. Um, so I put the, so on our website, you can find everything from seeking integrity at the bottom of the homepage. It'll take you over to the webinars, drop-in groups, podcasts. Dr. Rob's Sex, Love, and Addiction podcast has had over 1.3 million downloads. I haven't checked it in a while, so it may be higher, but but it's it's one of those things where you can find all of that and the work group. So the work group for Betrayed Partners with Angela Spearman starts again January 10th. And so that will be the next course you know, for Betrayed Partners. It's really good. You, you know. And then we've got an empowered women's retreat. We've got um, one in Kentucky, in January at the Red River Gorge. It's going to be gorgeous. And then we have one in Austin, Texas in March. And again, you can find all of that on there, or I'll put my email in Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Hey, Tammy, okay, the how, next how dumb am I that, that you said gorge and what was it? You said gorge twice. in Red River ways, thought, Gorge. And? And then it will be in Austin in Texas oh, in okay. March. Got it. Yes. Okay. okay. Together 20 years, D-Day two years ago, living apart, both in therapy since he sees the CSAT now. We had a simple pact. If you can't do it in front of me, then don't do it. And we <laughs> defined that. I caught him sexting one time, then confessed to acting out six times with a couple watching only. Had a disclosure, but he, but I think he withholds. As Dr. Eddie said, I have chosen a partner with an addict brain, a compulsive disorder, and is emotionally immature. If he has been living 20 years like this, there has to be more, question mark? Well, I, with all due respect, um, I am compulsive. I have an addict brain and I'm emotionally immature. I admit to all of it. But I don't have to have slips and I especially don't have to lie about them. So lying is a choice. I'm not going to tell you. Um, telling you part of it and not all of it is a choice. So I don't care. What is important to me is that um, addicts don't get excuses. Oh, well, I'm sorry they did that because they're really immature and they're compulsive. That is the description of the problem. The, the issue is not I feel bad for them doing that or when are they going to get better from their emotional maturity. I may never get a, better from my emotional maturity, but I can stop acting out. And I can be, and I can certainly be honest. And it really worries me that you are getting uh, a consistent, for, you're consistently still being lied to. And by the way, it isn't six times, it's 10 times. And it wasn't just watching only, it was live because we lie and we minimize. And if you caught him, that means he wasn't going to tell you. So by the way, this is an opportunity if you have the resources, this is someone who does need treatment, who should be um, doing a consultation with me, who should be coming to a treatment center because um, look, you're already a part. He's been in therapy. Um, what, what part of this is gonna end the relationship if you don't get honest with me and start being real, what part of that does he not understand? So part of what I'd be thinking about that is, um, I'm not sure I can stay with you. That's what I'd be thinking about. Um, you've already had disclosure, but I think he withholds. You know he withholds. He's been lying to you. So this is not someone who's recovery. And I really love Dr. Eddie. I do think that his focus is a lot more on inner child and your emotional challenges and 
And that is a deep part of the work. But almost above that is how do you get and stay into recovery? How do you stay sober? How do I how um um how do I get up my courage and be more honest? Um, I wouldn't want to be involved in a deeper way with someone who is doing this two years after living apart and being in therapy. So um, I know Tammy's going to say, what is he doing? And what is he, how is he, what is he going to meetings? Is he all of that? And by the way, and I, I, I want to say, uh, regardless of any of this, just seeing a CSAT doesn't mean that someone gets the help they need. Um, I trained CSATs for years, and I can tell you that some of them are excellent therapists, but they had no idea how to do this work. They were kind, they were compassionate, they were warm, they were trauma focused, but they didn't understand that addiction needs direction, challenge, structure, and then maybe you get to the other stuff. So, and I've met some other therapists who got it right away. So just because you have the initials and no offense, it's great that you have them, it's important. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to manage, especially somebody who's still lying and acting out. And if you are looking for someone for him, uh, and I don't know if you're working with Dr. Eddie or someone's working with Dr. Eddie, but it sounds like um, more information is needed. Um, so maybe Tammy can help direct you with that. Um, Actually, and, all I did was put the tag for treatment that this is somebody who is, you guys are apart for two years. Like how long is that going to continue? Like, I mean, yeah, I mean everybody gets to pick their journey, but I'm going, gosh, you know, you, you know, here you are waiting two years and he's still acting out and you're catching them, you know, at some point, you know, if, if the goal is for uh, reunification, then what does he need to do? And, and you were really right. clear, abundantly clear. If you can't do it in front of me, don't do it, you know, and you still had to catch him. He didn't even go, you know, I know we agreed to this. And, you know, like Dr. Rob talked about, like, you know, I, I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't seeing my sponsor, whatever you know, and I acted out and here's my plan for how I'm going to do things differently. You know, that was a wake up call, you know, so I hear he's just waiting for you to catch him again, you know, and there you guys are living, you know, those separate lives. So, and everybody Who gets knows to pick. What again, this is no own. judgment. This is it. This is no, everybody gets to pick. So please don't take any of this as, you know, like, oh, you should do whatever. Everybody picks their path, you know, so. Yeah, I'm not saying leave or stay, but right. I'm saying that this is a I don't even think with all due respect that you get the degree of problem here because you said, Oh, he's only watching. Um, you caught him and then he confessed. And then he said it was more. And you know, this is not honesty. This is not recovery. This is not how, who I would want to be involved with. I would want someone to come to me and said, you know, I, I got to tell you, I was sexting and uh, this is what it was. And this is how I cut it off. And this is what I'm doing about it that you had to drag this out of him that doesn't feel like a very healthy situation to me. And I'm so, so sorry for saying that to you, but actions are what matter. What matters in our work is actions, not so much words, but what are the actions? And this person's lying and keeping secrets and minimizing those aren't the word, the actions I would want to see. Um, okay. Okay. The next one to a partner of someone with sexual addiction, what is the biggest advice you have for someone who is considering rebuilding their relation Ship with a sexually addicted partner. Yes, seek therapy individually, each of us, then couple therapy. Is there more to add besides outreach, life moving forward in the hopes of monogamy with a sex addict? It's a lot of questions in that thing. Um, in, I mean, useful, but there's more than one. So Tammy, maybe we could go through them one at a time. Um, well, I, I think we, like, well, to me, a little monogamy. bit of it is what you just said, you know, it's, it's actions. What is that person doing? to show you that, you know, that the, you know, the sex addict, what is he doing on a daily basis that shows you his actions are moving forward, not just, um, I'm doing this until I get you. And then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to slide back to, into my, I mean, unfortunately, that's what I hear often is, oh, now we're, you know, back together again. And so all of a sudden the addict stops doing the behaviors that were helpful for them like 12 step and seeing a CSAT therapist and do I mean, it, it's a daily reprieve. We have a daily reprieve from our addiction. So what we do today is how we stay in recovery today. So, um, but, but, and like, I wish there was a cookbook. I love debate. You know, I wish there was a cookbook method of do this, this, and this, and then you'll all be fine. And that's not it. Each relationship is different. Sex addiction is is very different from chemical addiction. Chemical addiction is abstinence. This is the messy intimacy and connection. And how do we, you know, how do we navigate that in a different way? Um, but I think the biggest thing for a partner: make sure you have healthy boundaries for you 
and then watch what his, you know, what his actions are. So, you know, it, to me, that would be my best, biggest thing. What do you think? I'm writing a note for everybody. Um, okay. Is he taking a work group? Is he involved in a work group? So what I'm doing, just so you, um, but I'm, I can't type and talk at the same time. So well, what the work I wrote groups down, are all on the, yeah, they're all listed in the no, chat. But what so. I did, I'm sorry, Tammy, was I wanted, I wanted to give an example of um, what, what are, when we say you need to be doing something, you know, what is he doing? Is he going to 12 step meetings? Is, does he have a sponsor? Is, can he tell you each day of the week what he's working on? You know, what are the actual, again, I can't say this enough times, what actions, not words are you seeing? By the way, um, I do say this a lot, you know, um, and to you partners, please don't have sex with us unless, uh, please don't have sex with us without without a condom or whatever, um, especially if we don't have a lot of recovery. Some spouses will want to be sexual in order to reassure themselves that, oh, well, I'm, I, 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 if they have a lot of sex with me, then maybe they won't be with other people or to reassure yourselves that they really do love you and they really do care about you and they really are attracted to you. And I understand those things, but they're not the right reasons to be sexual. Um, and especially, and this is Rob's, Dr. Rob's famous line, uh, why would you have sex with someone you don't trust? So while your goal is monogamy and to get closer, that's my clients when they come into treatment they're like how can i figure out how to work things out with my spouse and i'm sitting there saying well what about today how do you figure out how you left your spouse acting that way so i would say more about what are you what's going on now and what makes you feel safe and do you feel safe rather than looking at the end result so uh let's keep going Yes. Okay. So the next one kind of tags onto what you said. My husband and I are living separately after a relapse and we had sex one night that uh, he stopped over. How do I restart my boundaries? Uh, well, I don't mean to be simplistic, but restart them. It's sort of like an addict. You know, I had, I had 300, I had three months of recovery and then I had a slip. Well, okay. You start recounting your time. You go back to the things that worked for you. What I don't want you to do is feel shameful. And I especially want you guys to hear, we don't act out because you had sex with us. <laughs> At the other end of the spectrum, you know, is you were sexual with us, and but you're afraid that that will trigger us into acting out again. I cannot say enough times, if I want to act out, I will. If you drop a pencil, if you divorce me, if you know, one of my poor parents is ill. It doesn't matter what's going on out there. I can go for a walk. I can see a therapist. I can take a vacation. I can divorce you. But the decision to go act out, whether we're making love or not talking to each other, that's my decision alone. And so, you know, I don't know if that's a relapse for him, what his commitment is, and he needs to take that wherever he needs to take it. But I just suggest you be kinder to yourself. But I, I think there is a question here that you might want to ask, which is why? Why did I break my boundary? What was in my mind? What did I think? Was it, you know, that maybe we'll work this out now because, or maybe we'll be closer or maybe he'll only want me or whatever that is. Um, I do think it's worth your own questioning about if you didn't think that was a good idea or you had a commitment to not doing it, what left you making that decision? Um, I do think that's something for you to reflect on, but please be kind to yourself. Um, we all want to be close to the people we love, broken or not, so... Well, and you can, you know, maybe it's okay for you guys to be sexually intimate. I don't know. I'm like, you know, bound, boundaries are for safety. What do you need for your safety? So, and, and yeah, I love your answer of like, just restart. So, okay. So next well, I do have one more thing, of course, which is what is, what is intimacy? Mm -hmm. You know, what is, are you guys practicing, Tammy talks about this a lot. Are you practicing, this may sound simplistic, dating? hand-holding, a massage, combing his or her hair, you know, um, having those little 20 minute conversations where you're just talking about things that are positive. There are so many, are you hugging? There are so many steps that, that I think, especially for addicts, we need to take place before we're sexual because we're used to, I think about it, I do it. And we don't connect with the people that we're sexual with, or we're connect with people who aren't available. So I, I would be less 
I would be more comfortable if you said we were being sexual after working so hard on connection and intimacy and loving each other and we taking all these steps. I think you would feel better too if you had a whole list of things that happened. Uh, I'm not saying foreplay. I'm not saying what happens right before it, but actually taking time to be intimate without being sexual over time. And then I might feel better about being sexual with someone. Okay. Okay, I'm the betrayed partner. How do I express while I see him doing the work until I get disclosure and polygraph? And I'll add on to that, that I do not feel safe. He is safe to me. And I still do not see him doing enough recovery work. He is doing more than two months ago, but it's not consistent, nor is it daily. He has a CSAP, but I'm not confident. Is there something that will change after disclosure? I feel like the conversation is always me telling him what he is doing is just not enough. I feel judgy and I hate this feeling. Well, Tammy, again, I'm going to turn to you because you speak to so many partners. Uh, I'm glad to answer parts of this, but I'm just thinking, how did it hit you right away? Well, I, I, so I shared and I found the podcast with uh, Dr. You, that you did with Dr. Stantec, and it was January of 2019. I found the actual one oh my God. on We Do. It was no, it COVID. was. I was shocking how long ago it was. But I love that one because that's what a healthy relationship is. And I think it's the conversation. Is that what we're striving for? Because if we are, then how do we, you know, how do we navigate this? Because this is not working. And and I think it's okay to say, I don't like how I feel. And I'm sure it does, you know, it comes across as judgy. So how do we navigate this? Um, the I, this formal therapeutic disclosure, you know, it's, if it's been, I'm like, I a hundred percent agree with that. As long as, you know, he's, you're each working with someone, but I, I tagged in, um, the American psychological association also does not recommend polygraphs for mental health issues. So I put the, um, link to the publication in the chat. I know a betrayed partners always think, well, if I get a polygraph, then I'll know it only measures stress. It does not measure honesty. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. That's a whole other topic. I want to keep it on this, but, but like, I think it's like, let's have a conversation. Let's listen to the podcast, sex, love and addiction, January of two. 2019, Dr. Stan Tatkin and Dr. Rob talking about, we do, this is, if this is what we're going for and here's where we are, you know, what are we each willing to do, you know, that, that will help navigate this. So, um, I don't blame you for, I mean, one more thing, Debbie Allen did a great, um, uh, webinar on three circle plans for partners. And sometimes the inner circle for partners is I just need to let his, you know, like, it's okay to express like, you know, this is what I'm looking for. And maybe it's not, you're not doing enough. This is what I'm looking for. Can you show me with your actions that you're willing to do these things, you know, and then what he chooses to do or not do, that's, that's on him. It's data for you. Thoughts, I Dr. Rob? That, Please. um, I, I just can't imagine waiting that long for disclosure. <laughs> Um, disclosure should be done in my opinion within six to eight weeks. And, you know, I've done a lot of them in outpatient therapy. So of course I wouldn't be sexual with someone. Um, be, when, of course I wouldn't feel safe unless I knew what had happened. And, um, I, I would feel judgmental and afraid if I didn't know what happened and I wouldn't feel safe. And so I, and I, so I think that you need to go through that process for sure. I agree with Tammy. I think polygraphs are false reassurance to spouses that somehow you think that this is going to guarantee something, or I can act out the day after I get a polygraph. I can fool a polygraph. Excuse me. And polygraphs, as Tammy said, are when none of the CSATs are trained in using them. And there's uh, no protocol. It, there's no efficacy. There's no protocol. Yeah. They're not legal in court. So I have all kinds of feelings about the polygraph, but regardless of that, um, uh, I think you need more information um, and you need to get through that disclosure. And no one, I don't think any spouse here likes how they feel. Who wants to feel untrusting? Who wants to worry about who you're with? Who wants to feel judgmental and afraid every time you, I mean, who wants to feel that way? I wouldn't, but rather than being, and this thing that Tammy called about, um, talked about ambivalent love. That's really what you're saying is sometimes I feel close and sometimes I feel far away and sometimes I, I'm hoping and sometimes um, this isn't fun. One of the things that I tell spouses when I see them is whatever you had before is over. You know, it's over that relationship that you had 
in the trash. Don't know what it is, but it isn't what you thought it was, obviously. And what is to come, I don't know what that's going to be either. But in the moment, it's going to be crappy. And I have spouses say, you know, I can't believe I'm up and down and right and left and feeling overwhelmed and I should be able to handle this. And, and I say, welcome to your new normal, which is crazy. This is a crazy situation that you most likely had no idea was happening or is as bad. And now you're finding this out and you feel crazy. Well, welcome to the club. Every spouse feels crazy. And so I would forgive yourself for whatever feelings come up, how you act on them, something else, but whatever feelings come up and, you know, join some of the partner support groups. So you can say, I want to kill this person. Actually, it kind of is funny. It's not funny, Tammy, but one of our clients today said um, that he was worried that his wife going to therapy was going to lead her to being angrier than she was. And then that the therapy might lead to them splitting up. And I said to him, don't you understand that the therapy is there to as a steam vent? It's a place where she can go and talk about her anger and talk about her hurt so that she can let a little bit of that go and feel supported before coming home to you. So what you get is even this much of what that person was feeling before they went to therapy. And our job is not to break people apart. Our job is to follow them and make sure they're safe with each other and hope that it works out. Um, what else do I want to say about all of this? Um, I do, I'm pushing back on partners today a little bit, Tammy, and I know I'm going to hear about it, but your judgments about what is enough or what isn't may not be reality. You know, we may be doing a lot. And just because, excuse those words, you think we should be doing more does not necessarily mean that we should be doing more. So you have to understand that your, um, uh, I don't want to use the word demands, your expectations are filled with your hurt, your anger, your desire to have reassurance, your desire for a guarantee or a commitment that this is never and I'll never. And, you know, as much as Tammy and I talk about addicts having to do things and take responsibility and, and all of that stuff, ultimately, um, it, 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 what we do is up to us. And if you don't feel safe, you need to talk about not feeling safe. But I don't think you can say, well, how come you didn't go to a meeting tonight? And why didn't you? That's putting the focus on us rather than trying to find safety for yourself. What is it that you need for you to help you feel safe? So um, it's not consistent. It's not daily. Not everyone needs daily. I hate to say that, but not everyone. Do you, what does inconsistent mean? I, I don't know. So I think there's a lot more for you to think about and look at about what safety would be for you and how you would find that. And what does it mean whether he or she is doing enough or not enough? And to also accept the fact and give yourself a lot of room to be judgy and to hate that feeling because every spouse hates what they're feeling around all of this. Um, go ahead, Tammy. Okay, there's only a couple more, but I would like to get sure. um, through the next two. So hang in there. Okay. Because the last one is about Christmas. So I want you to. So same person who mentioned Dr. Eddie for a betrayed partner who knows the addict brain, compulsive disorder, and emotional immaturity. When I see behaviors that I attribute to these unrelated to sex or acting out, I conclude he hasn't conquered the right. addiction and is pushing me away. I need him to show up differently where I don't recognize those attributes. It's tough because it could be his baseline personality, which would likely be okay to a person not betrayed. Maybe it's time to move on. Well, I don't have enough information, right? We don't know how long they've been working on this, either one of them or whether you don't conquer addiction, by the way, nobody conquers addiction. Um, you learn to, you don't conquer diabetes. You know, you learn to live with it. You learn to manage it. You learn to accept it, but no one conquers it because that implies that they're, you know, they got over the hill and they're done. And we live with this all of our lives. And so do you, if you're with us, you live with this your whole life, this doubt, this fear, this concern, it gets a lot better. And as you see us change, but that to your question, you know, I can teach somebody how to not act out. And if they are committed to that process um, over time or right away, they won't, they'll stop acting out. But teaching someone to be a better person, teaching someone to be absolutely truthful about whether they took the garbage out or not, you know, that may take time. Um, and I understand that if I'm lying to you about the garbage and I say I took it out when I didn't, that you're thinking, well, if you can lie about that, what else can you lie about? And that may be true. But I um, and I hear a lot here, by the way, and I excuse my language on the holiday, but, you know, he or she is doing really well in their recovery and they're not acting out anymore. And I think that, you know, I'm really, you know, feeling more comfortable with their sobriety, but they're still such a jerk. <laughs> 
And, you know, sobriety is achievable in a reasonably short period of time if you're committed. Being a better person takes a long time. So um, I think a lot more conversations about this need to happen with him. This is a couples therapy, again, situation where you can talk about your expectations about what maybe he doesn't even fully understand what you're asking of him. By the way, I will say this to many of you spouses. Another thing you won't want to hear is that we have trouble with the truth, even if it isn't. We have trouble disappointing you. We don't want to see your angry face. We, as much we do to disappoint you, we don't want to say that thing that might upset you for whatever reason. We will go miles around lying just to make sure that you're not upset with us. Don't ask me why. It will take a week to talk about. But what is important is the two of you were talking about this. And as I said, I also said to the I think I said to you guys tonight, I know I said it to the clients, is that I expect that, that addicts are going to lie to me. But, uh, they lie. But what I also expect is they're going to come back like the next day and say, I'm so, so sorry I wasn't being honest. And to me, coming back and the honest, being willing to have the courage to come back to you and say, I wasn't honest, is so much more important to me than whether you initially said it or didn't say it. It's the responsibility to doing the right thing as quickly as you can do it that matters to me. So I don't hear time to move on. I hear a lot of learning, a lot of growth, a lot of help needed. And this would be a good couples therapy situation and if you're looking yeah. for the right person write t-a-m-i at seekingintegrity.com okay oh tammy wait i i, I forgot you have something. you, you have one more you have to answer but i know but, i will answer it but i gotta okay, find but, something go ahead go ahead okay. go ahead i'm listening but but i want to tag onto this because you know time is dr rob said it timing and and i said earlier you know it's two to five years for oh there you go for for recovery to really start being integrated, that's awesome, into um, into all aspects of life. We struggle. You know, a 12-step program is a, you know, is an owner's manual on how we can do life differently. So it gives us an opportunity to do things differently, but it takes time. So if you're seeing consistent changes, even if they're little, you know, that's that's worth noting. But everybody- I mean, it makes me look like I have hair. It does make you look like, it looks like you have, yeah, it really does. Okay. Know, so the I last know. one, Dr. Rob, okay. update on new betrayed partner. I have no interest in spending time, spending Christmas with my sex addicted partner's family. Thoughts on that? Things you can add to that. This was all dropped on me less than a week ago. I need time to heal. Well, I think you've answered your own question. I agree. You know, what I, what I hear you're concerned about is what will people think? Or will they be disappointed in me? You know, I, I, I think without lying, you can say, I, I, I'm sick. I am not feeling well. And I don't want to expose the family to not feeling well, mean, meaning my rage, my disappointment. my. And I also don't think, and I really don't recommend that you go in there and fake it. You put that smile on your face and you pretend everything's fine. So I really think that you have, I don't think I know that you have every right to say under these circumstances, I don't feel safe. And please tell them I don't feel well, which you don't, and then take care of you. And then what are you going to do to enjoy or spend, not enjoy, but at least um, connect with other people um, to make the holiday uh, peaceful for you. But um, just because there's an expectation that we're supposed to, supposed to do something with the family doesn't mean that we have to. And by the way, there are other people who will show up and they'll get gifts and they'll be happy and, you know, they'll be fine. So let that obligation go and take care of yourself. Um, and with that, I'll say my gratitude again to you is to, is to you, Tammy, and for all your hard work. And um, I want to I know it shouldn't be on the recording, but it is. I just want to wish you guys the most peaceful new year. And I, I know this is a really good time to say peace on earth. So to all of you, and thank you again, Tammy, and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you. Yes. And the schedule's on the site. So there's a, a, a few differences, but there's still lots of opportunities to connect. So thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye Dr. Rob.